I'm ready. Uh, dear Facebook Pure Urology viewers, good evening one and all. Today's our surgical technique based talk is based on the thulium laser enucleation of the prostate by Professor Dr. Andrew Gross. As you all know this name, you will be surprised why I am listening thulium laser enucleation because you might have listened this name more so for the ureteroscopy, flexible ureteroscopy and stone management uh, most of the times. But sir also has developed interest and uh, this he is doing for a long time. He wanted to show the video of uh, around 20 minutes uh, a bit edited uh, now and then total this 21 minutes video will be shown and he will be explaining how enucleation can be done. Uh, coming to the Professor Dr. Andrew Gross, uh, Professor Gross is an urologist in Aspios Hospital, Bamberg, Hamburg with over 37 years of experience. His main interest lies in the field of endourology and lasers in urology and therapeutic treatment of benign prostatic enlargement. Professor Grasso, Gross is uh, a top urologist according to the German magazine Focus which has been publishing lists, lists of doctors in Germany for over 20 years. He did training in urology in prestigious hospitals of uh, Amber. Aside from his career, the Andrea Gross has also been taken in research and has published about 200 abstract articles, 143 articles in national and international journals. He also co-authored 37 books, presided about 250 lectures in national and international congresses. He is the member of many international medical associations. I have a small experience to share. Uh, when I have, I was in Vancouver some wait around 5-6 years back, he has given talk uh, on the stents uh, and their role. The last slide he kept is, when you require to put a stent, if you don't put, you will be putting the stent again and again. He means that if the ureter is not, not dilated, if you forcibly do RIRS with access sheath, there is a chance that stricture can occur and that stricture you need, you need to put stent in lifelong, removing and putting, removing and putting. And that lecture was a memorable for me and I am happy that being the pure urology founder today I am interviewing such a well known renowned international urologist. Thank you sir for accepting the invitation. Actually we are keeping the surgery part directly on the screen. Uh, because of the technical issues, we don't want to close it. So, Sari will be directly talking about the video now. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction. Uh, I'm shocked that I'm 37 years uh, in urology. That uh, proves how old I uh, came. And uh, you all know I've been several times in India and I always enjoyed uh, visiting your country. And actually, I was... Um, trapped on my way to India with Corona. Um, I was sitting in the lounge to fly out to India. All of a sudden they said, uh, please come to the counter. You're, you've been taken off the passenger list. This is when I realized Corona is an international problem. Yes. Today, I would like to show you an absolutely unedited video um, uh, uh, of a prostate enucleation, a prostate of um, uh, 100 gram. So that's a very nice size of prostate. And I, I start right away. Um, can, you, can you see the arrow? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, perfect. So you see aside the veru, you see this little arcs. I call those arcs the Herman arcs because Thomas Herman, um, who was uh, the first uh, European fellow in India with Mahesh Desai in, um, in uh, Nadiyad, he introduced me to this anatomical structure and this is where you start the procedure and this is where we are starting now um you see yes sir the, the prostate here is the vero and just in front of the vero you at, at the hermit's arcs you draw a line to be on the safe side distally because you do not want to harm the sphincter um, even so we know mostly if we harm the sphincter, we harm it at 12 o'clock. So this is a sort of a horseshoe kind of incision. And then you see, I just simply push a little bit with the uh, tip of my instrument 
and then I see the um, anatomical um, uh, border between capsule and adenoma. Um, and whenever I see a little bleeder, I um, vaporize it. This is, uh, and by, by the way, if you have questions, please interrupt me. Yes, sir. Uh, I will be interrupting, sir. Thank you. Um, so this is a psyllium fiber laser. That's the latest generation of lasers. You are all aware um, for the past 30 years, we had either a holmium laser as a pulsed laser, or we had a psyllium laser, uh, which is a continuous wave laser. Psyllium fiber laser is, um, I would call it an ultra pulse laser. So we have a very high uh, frequency of 200 Hertz here uh, in this case. Um, and we are using 100 Watts. Um, by doing that, you realize already that uh, we have uh, even less bleeding um, as compared to the other, the previous uh, lasers, uh, such as Holmium or Psyllium Yak uh, laser. But in opposite to the uh, Psyllium Yak laser, the continuous wave laser, we have these pulses and those pulses they cause little plasma bubbles at the end of the laser fiber. You've just seen it briefly. And these little bubbles um, uh, are very good for the coagulation of little bleeders. Um, we have a, a vaporization or a coagulation mode as well. So they, uh, you have two petals. Uh, I said for the active part, like here, we have uh, 100, um, 100 watt and 200 uh, hertz. And for coagulation, we have 30 watt and 80 hertz. And again and again, we just push with the tip of the instrument, the adenoma away. This is what you do with your finger in an open procedure. Yes, sir. Uh, but just here, you see right away, if you have a little bleeder, you just vaporize it. You are moving the laser fiber very fast. Is it essential to avoid charring in this uh, laser? Well, uh, I, I personally love the char charring because if you have the charring, you have this brownish or uh, yellowish uh, uh, sort of tissue. And then if you break the adenoma away from the capsule, then all of a sudden you see this white uh, layer and then you know I am in the right layer. Um, if you use a pure holmium laser, you're all aware, then you have only this fluffy white whitish tissue. And then if you're not on track, you don't really know which is the anatomically uh, correct layer. So uh, a little bit of charring is, uh, for my personal um, experience, is good. You see, we uh, this is a touch laser, so you really touch the tissue if you want to um, uh, come forward. Um, maybe it is a little bit unfair that I'm using uh, my movement so quickly here. Um, if if you start this experience, uh, this uh, procedure, you should not try to be fast. This is what my mentor always uh, said he said don't try to be fast try to be good okay. by the way if you are good you become faster but it's not the um, challenge to be fast okay uh, you are, are you how much uh, mechanical component you are using in your uh, i mean uh, large glands are yeah you... that's uh, that's a very good point um i use a lot of mechanic um, pushing, soft pushing, just always a little millimeter or two. And usually the pure lasering time uh, in a procedure like that, uh, like uh, this, as I said, it's a hundred gram prostate, uh, is about 10 minutes. Uh, but the uh, surgical time, excluding the uh, morselation is about 20 minutes. So what do we learn from that? It's about 50, 50 um, blunt, uh, pushing enucleation and 50% uh, really active activation. You are doing N block here, sir. This is an N block here so far. You uh, see, it is still attached at the 12 o'clock position, which I'm opening now. Yeah. Um, so for a 100 gram prostate, um, 
I always have to cite Thomas Herman. He, he actually, he wrote his doctoral thesis under my guidance, but, uh, um, but now he's a professor for urology by himself. And uh, so he's teaching me a lot. I'm very fond of uh, single lobe uh, on block enucleation, but he said, this is as um, useless as if you say we are two fat people and there is a door. So let's go through the door together. So what you should do is if there are two fat people, one should go through the, through the door first and then the other. That makes life easier. So um, for a large uh, prostate, I, um, I take it off the capsule, but then I still divide it to get one lobe and then the other lobe into the, um, the bladder. For prostate- In the laser fiber position, depending on the curvature continuously, not keeping at 12 o'clock not keeping at six every time uh, is what, what you should do what you should do is you should have the handle of your instrument at 90 degrees to the place where you are just working so if you uh, so that you always have the um, capsule uh, in 90 degrees with your instrument okay that's a good point here you see that um I'm almost around the, um, the adenoma and since it's a medium-sized prostate or let's say a rather large prostate and um, I divide it in two parts. Um, you see at 12 o'clock that I have already solved it from the capsule. Um, as you know, the, um, the transurethral enucleation, no matter whether you do it with holmium, cilium, bipolar, monopolar or whatever, it's specifically good for the large glands um, um, because there the adenoma and the capsule are not as attached uh, as they are in small glands if you have a very small gland and you want to do an enucleation then you um, do have to be active much more um, active blunt dissection um, uh, an active dissection with the laser instead of blunt dissection as you do it here. Um, even so, we have a lot of visitors and, and all of you are invited to visit our institution if you want to learn it. Um, they always ask me, what is the smallest prostate you do and when do you go back to TRP? And frankly speaking, I do all my prostates as an enucleation, no matter even if it's a 10 gram prostate. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in 10 to 20, 30, 40 grams, mechanical will not be there. So you have to be, be very difficult. Yes, very difficult and precise. You have to be. And uh, and then you should have an idea about anatomy. Yeah. Um, uh, you see, we, we interestingly, uh, the, prost the anatomy of the prostate is not very well described. I, I just um, I'm just about to publish a book, which will be out in about a month's time. And uh, I wrote one chapter on anatomy of the prostate. And I had to take one slide from 1937, because obviously after that time, no one was interested or really interested to uh, care about prosthetic anatomy. The BPH guys, uh, this is not true for the uh, prostate cancer guys. So let me just interrupt the ana anatomy thing. We always, always, always have a bleeder at two o'clock. That's the one here. And then you see, I, I keep a little distance from the, um, from the bleeder with the laser fiber that this uh, plasma bubble of the laser fiber can develop and uh, you have a, a fair chance to stop this bleeder. If it's a venous bleeder and you cannot stop it, just proceed with your um, enucleation and um, uh, don't spend too much time with that. It's of course nicer if it's not bleeding, but uh, you're all aware if you have a venous uh, bleeder and behind this bleeder you have a sinus, um, this may cause a lot of uh, trouble. So uh, talking about the anatomy again, um, inter interestingly, we have the the most arterial uh, supply at five and seven o'clock right next to the veru from the right and left hand side this is where you have to pay attention 
And if you enucleate, like I'm doing here, uh, if I have a bleeding problem, it is either at the mucosa at the apex or at the bladder neck. With the bladder neck, I come to that later on. Um, and then we always have this bleeder at 2 and 11 o'clock. They are very, very common. Um, so, and uh, I always try to prevent it. But um, as you see, even in this uh, video, if it's, uh, I run into those bleeders and um, then I leave it as it is. The six o'clock part um, can be challenging because uh, the, the urethra is not going straight through the prostate. Very often it has about a 30 degree um, uh, acceleration towards the bladder neck. And if you produce the prostate anterograde towards the bladder neck, you may easily run under, under the bladder neck. So you really have to pay attention uh, where you go if you are at the bottom of the prostate. Yeah, beautiful. So what, Slowly. I, what I do in um, if I have trouble at six o'clock, I come from the side. So I uh, do incisions from two o'clock towards five o'clock, from eleven o'clock towards seven o'clock, so that um, I just have the prostate only at a pedicle at six o'clock. Hockey stick, uh, you agree with that hockey stick type of? Yeah, it's uh, well, uh, talking with Indians about hockey sticks, uh, that's always troublesome because the Indian team is unfortunately mostly better than the German team. Um, but uh, indeed, not the, the modern type of uh, hockey sticks, you know, the modern type of hockey sticks, they have this very short curve. So when I played hockey, it was still a, a long round uh, curvature. So that right. it, it's an old fashioned hockey stick. Okay. Actually, my father played in the national team for Germany hockey, and he always was afraid uh, in competitions with the Indians because he said they are always beating us. That's it. And uh, you are using laser exactly perpendicular all around. What about your external movements? Will you will you lock your hand into the lum lumen of the working element, or you'll be holding like this? Um, I I I hold it in the working element, but at at this part at eleven o'clock, I flip my hand over and have the instrument more or less upside down. While doing this, left side of the gland looks little difficult if you are a right-hander. What is your comment, sir? <laughs> That's a very good point because um, um, you might know Dr. Netsch, who is uh, uh, part of my team. He is an extreme left-hander oh. and he's always also uh, having trouble on the left side, like myself, and I'm an extreme right-hander. I cannot even write a, uh, a circuit in, uh, with my left hand. So obviously, it is not a question of uh, whether you are right or left-hander. One side is always more difficult. And interestingly, most people tell me it is the left side. Okay. Um, you see <laughs> here at 6 o'clock, we are much more active uh, than at the lateral parts. And we push a little bit. And then if you see those little um, bridges, so we call it, and then you actively use the laser. Um, Whatever the lobe you start first will have advantage because uh, you can separate the lobe easily with the capsule. Other other part will be slightly unstable. Is it uh, logical or no? I'm sorry, I didn't get this point. Uh, uh, whichever lobe you start first, you yeah. try to do uh, better than the opposite lobe. Does it sound logical or no logic? <laughs> um, Interestingly, I, I never thought about it. You, you are right. But if you have one lobe in the bladder, of course, it is easier then to solve the second lobe because um, then um, you have more space in the prostatic cavity. But um, I hope you can see here now that I'm going laterally very deep instead of going anterograde and pushing the prostate into the bladder. So. Okay. Um, I come from both sides. Yeah, yeah. 
because it is but very you do perforation of a thick uh, tissue over the six o'clock position yeah oh uh, it's very good that you uh, mentioned perforation um, everyone is afraid of perforation and i can tell you it doesn't do anything it doesn't do anything at all i would say in 50 percent of my patients and, and you heard me correctly in 50 percent of my patients i have some sort of major or smaller uh, perforation and we have checked that uh, it doesn't do anything to the patients they do not feel it they do not have more harm or pain um, and it doesn't do anything to the uh, healing to the post-operative results so it is still considered to be a complication but frankly speaking i don't think it is uh, in this video charring is very very less what laser mission and what laser setting if you don't mind yeah uh, uh, once again for the um, the um, cutting i have 100 uh, watts and 200 hertz a very fast movement uh, 200 hertz is a lot and uh, for coagulation i have 30 watts and 80 hertz okay in thulium fiber laser you have uh, how many watts available with you oh actually you can go even further up you can go to uh, 1000 uh, hertz and uh, so uh, this is an incredible energy you can apply but um I'm not very fond uh, to apply too much energy because I think this causes some sort of burn injury or whatsoever. You see this high wattage that came with the green light laser story because we started with an 80 watt green light laser and then after some time we realized it is not as good as we thought it is. So we came with a 200 uh, with a 120 watt green light laser, and then it was not as good as we thought it is. So we came with a 180 watt laser, and then all of the other laser manufacturers said we need to have higher wattage again because, frankly speaking, most users do not know too much about laser physics. So they thought if I have higher wattage, uh, I am better. So, um, but I. I don't think it is necessary at all to go with high wattage. Again, when we did open surgery, and many of you will have done that or are still doing that, you have zero watt. In your finger, you have zero watt. And um, so um, there's a very nice paper out from Jens Rasweiler um, with the title, How Low Can We Go? And um, it, you can easily do an enucleation with 30 watts. Uh, we once had trouble with one of our lasers, so we had only the stone laser available, and then we did uh, 30 watt uh, uh, enucleations. It takes a little bit longer. The fiber is a bit more sticky at the um, at the tissue, uh, but you can do it. So, what I wanted to say is, you don't need a Ferrari if you uh, drive in uh, in the downtown area. So you don't need 200 watts if you do a prostate. Okay. But uh, charring is very less in this video. Charring yeah. is, charring uh, is the, uh, the, the, the percentage of charring is less than a psyllium yak laser, uh, but it is more than a holmium laser. Yes, sir. And yes. This is a very nice compromise for my taste. As I said before, I'm, I'm keen to have a little bit of charring. Yeah. Because in homium, everything looks white, even though charring is less. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, and, and, but then, if you have lost your track with a homium laser. Very difficult to come back. Yeah, because everything is white. It's if you difficult. lost your way in, uh, with a thulium laser, uh, you have this charring, very easy to find back. And you see, I have 10 residents in training here, yes, and, the, and the training is uh, five years, the cur curriculum in Germany. That means all, all six months, I start from the scratch to teach one of my residents how to work with the, with the laser, because they want to go out, they want to do their private practice or whatsoever, they want to know how to use a laser. And I find it much easier for me as a teacher 
to teach them uh, Thulium Laser because if, if they are all beginners, they do all the same mistakes, all the same mistakes I did, you did, everyone does. Um, and then you can help them much easier um, to learn the procedure. I find teaching, learning and teaching um, much more difficult with the uh, uh, Holmium laser. And now since we have uh, the Thulium fiber laser, which is a um, sort of ultra pulse laser, um, we can also do stones with it. And you see, many of my, my publications were on Thulium laser, but still when people ask me, I have money for a laser, what would you buy? I always said, get yourself a, a Holmium laser. Now since we have the Thulium fiber laser, I can just say, uh, get yourself a Thulium fiber laser. Do you enjoy Thulium fiber laser in, la in stone also? Like most of the world is now uh, turning towards the Thulium fiber laser for stone lithotripsy. Uh, we, um, you, you should invite in your master class here Christopher sure. Netsch from my team. He can show you how he's just melting away huge stones with the Thulium fiber laser. Yes. Um, it, it is really incredible. Um, and especially for you guys in India, you have so many more stones than we have. Um, uh, Mini and Micro Perk is, uh, came from India, so many of you are doing that, and you get through this little hole, the laser fiber, and um, he is doing stacks uh, with a Mini Perk now. Or if you say, I'm not doing uh, perks at all, I'm doing um, uroscopy only, then you uh, get your laser fiber uh, and the Thulium fiber laser out through your um, uteroscope, and then you are melting those mm. stones away. What is the name of the professor, sir? Sorry, don't mind. Uh, Net, uh, Net is N E T S C H. He Net. is co-author, co-author in many of my papers, so you'll find him easily. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Net. Net. Really, I think um, very often in my career, people came and said, "Oh, this is something new. This is uh, changing the world." And you see those things coming and going. And uh, if you've done uh, urology for a decade or a few, like myself, uh, I could write a history book uh, on tuna and uh, interstitial laser coagulation. And you name it, there are at least 20 things they came and, and, and left the scene again. I am sure the uh, thulium fi uh, the uh, thulium fiber laser is here to stay yes this sir is, and uh, um I, I i don't have any any commitments with any of those companies yeah. um but the, uh, the the great advantage of a thulium fiber laser is also that you don't have this huge machine and if you work in a setting like uh, many of you in india work that you have uh, commitment with different hospitals and uh, you, you you can simply uh, put the laser in the trunk of your car and uh, uh, take it from one hospital to the other because it's very light it doesn't have these huge cooling systems yes sir sir when you come to the bladder neck uh, sometimes mucosa you can take off only mucosa only mucosa even a little proximal to the bladder neck which is danger how to cut it off it will be floating because of gravity you cannot cut so what is the trick otherwise mucosa will be lifted it's not perforated so you, see it, you see it right in this second you go a little bit behind the uh, mucosa with your laser and then you uh, move it to yourself and always, always, always actively use the laser um, when you are at the bladder neck. If you are pushing there, uh, the uh, mucosa will rupture and the mucosa is always um, has a lot of blood supply. And then you, you have these uh, very nasty bleeders. So if I have a bleeding problem after the procedure, not during the procedure, after the procedure in the recovery room, it is always either the bladder neck or the apex. Those in between, as I told you, at two o'clock and at 11 o'clock, I can take care of that uh, during the procedure. But if you if you don't take care at the bladder neck, you, you may uh, face trouble. Uh, do you look for erotic orifice uh, 
uh, in the beginning or if it cannot be found what are the precautions at this stage you take well um one thing I, I would say here in public, of course, you look after the orifices. And one thing I'm telling you in private, I'm not looking at the orifices because even if you touch them with this laser, the penetration depth is so shallow, um, you, you don't do anything. Great. See, we do about uh, four prostates every day. And uh, of course, we touch the orifice once in a while. And maybe sometimes the patient says that he has some little flank pain because the orifice has an edema and you have a little bit of a hydronephrosis for a day or two. So you just give him some antiphlogistic medication and he will be fine. I cannot recall a single case where we had to do surgery uh, or another intervention due to orifice um, um, damage with uh, the Thulium lasers, either uh, um, thulium fiber or uh, thulium yak laser, you can really seal the um, uh, orifice with a green light laser. But uh, at least in my part of the world, uh, green light laser is dead. I don't know if anyone is still using it. Do you have any comment on the size of this sheet? We have come now in uh, 22 by 19 also, where your play, because laser fiber is anyway 500 microns. Uh, the play of the instrument inside the lumen of a fatty bilobed uh, prostate will be better. Any comment on that? Well, I, I use a 27 French uh, instrument um, and um, I, I think this doesn't matter too much. And, and let me just point out here, you see that I left a little ad piece of adenoma here at the uh, lateral lobe and that's the nice part. You can uh, really cut it off. This is almost impossible to do with a holmium laser. But once again, to the size of your instrument, um, I think a 22 uh, a French instrument is, is very convenient. And uh, um, yeah, take whatever you are happy with. The laser fiber is 900 micron um, here. I, I like this rather large fiber because it is stiff at the end. And uh, I'm working with Wolf Instruments and uh, the, they produced a, speci a specific light, uh, fiber holder for me. So the fiber is really nicely fixed in the instrument. In the Olympus instrument, it is uh, flip-flopping a, a little bit back and forth. So, um, but okay. those are little gimmicks. Then once I have solved the um, adenoma from the capsule, I just look for major bleeders. Um, um, so frankly speaking, my staff is making fun at me about that because they say you are looking only for the major bleeders because you are never on night shifts. Um, but um, I think it doesn't matter if you have little venous bleeders here because I track the um, Foley catheter with the balloon into the prosthetic cavity and blow it up until I'm happy. So this will cover all the venous bleeders. Um, we quickly change to the um, Morsa later. And let me just give a few uh, short comments on morsalation. There are two morsalators out which are not dangerous. I, to, to my understanding, this is the Storch morsalator and the Wolf morsalator. Um, the wolf mausolator has been longer on the scene than the stores mausolator, but technically they are very similar. I'm not very fond of the luminous uh, mausolator because this is going back and forth and you don't see what you are doing at the end of your instrument, whereas the, uh, Holmium, uh, the, the uh, wolf and the stores mausolator, you see it here, they have the opening at uh, 12 o'clock and uh, you suck the um, adenoma to the tip of your mausolator and then you mausolate. This is work for monkeys, actually. Uh, you sit there and if you have a huge prostate and um, since um, people know in our part of the world that we do large prostates, even huge prostates, uh, transurethrally, we very frequently see prostates of 200, 250 gram. And then you sit there, it, it is incredibly boring um, and do the mausolation. Um, the mausolator of Wolf um, has up to 3,200 uh, rotations. 
But so when I was younger, I thought pedal to the metal and I want to go fast. No, uh, you are much better if you do a comparably small, uh, a slow mosolation. So I usually have uh, the mosolator now on about 500 to 700 rotations because then the, the suction mechanism uh, is better and uh, you always have the mosolate in front and on the tip of your mosolator and you don't have this beach ball uh, phenomenon. If you have a beach ball, go down to 200 or 150 uh, rotations and then you really can suck it. So this is the video I, I wanted to show you. Um, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. During marcellation, if it is a large gland end block, continuously it will be in touch with the marcellator and it will take a good time. But if you make small, small pieces by chance three, four, it will take more time because they, are, they will float away to the dome and again you have to bring back a little risky bladder may collapse and you have to be constantly, uh, constantly uh, careful. So what is the trick to when it comes to the end of the marcellation, they run away from the marcellator, the pieces, because the yeah. gravity will not be there. Comment on that. That's a very good point. So what I do, I grab these little pieces with suction only, retract it in the, uh, in the prosthetic cavity, and then they are trapped. They cannot run away. So, um, and then I lift the mausolator a little bit up to the roof of the cavity, and then the mausolator is really trapped between the capsule and the mausolator, and it cannot run away. So this is, uh, and at every single procedure, at the very end, I always uh, empty the bladder completely under vision, and then I fill it again because once in a while you have little, uh, little pieces of. Uh, Can I close the screen, sir? Is it over or you have any other video? No, I don't have another video. Oh, sorry. So you can you can you can directly come in uh, contact with us. Uh, the the second question is when you are doing initial part of a large median lobe, we'll try to cut five and seven o'clock position with laser fiber. But it takes very long time to reach the capsule and looks cumbersome. Instead, you start from uh, what the, you have shown, Arshu. So in any gland, better to start uh, distally with Arshu is better than making a trough, which takes long time with uh, laser fiber. Very good point. Uh, I am not doing a three lobe technique at all anymore. So uh, I always attach the middle lobe to either side. Usually I take it to the first side I'm taking care of. So I go up there and uh, push the middle lobe together with this side to the bladder neck. This, as you said, five o'clock and seven o'clock incision takes a lot of time and you never really know how deep you go. And either you are too shallow or you are too deep. But if you come from laterally and push it together with the lateral lobe, you are in the right layer. And then, by the way, the, the other part is just falling your way. Uh, if two fat people are there and you are finding one side pushing, other side pushing difficult, you feel it is congested and you can't do mechanical force, especially lower part capsule may be torn, lateral part it doesn't proceed well. In that case, uh, at which point of time you will bivalve it? Either after doing half of the gland all around or, or when you will, you will you wanted to have space for one fat person to go out? Yeah, so I, I usually... So my favorite uh, procedure now is doing a single lobe technique. But if it, uh, one is too fat, uh, I still go around the whole gland and try to go as far as possible. And then I see I'm in trouble. Then I um, incise at 12 o'clock. And then you see already where you came from the lateral side. Yeah, yeah. And then you go to the bladder neck. And with this long hockey sort of incisions, you go down laterally. And, uh, and then you just put this together with the uh, middle lobe into the bladder. And as I said, and then the other side is an easy game. Uh, Hermann's loop and uh, bipolar loops have come. They stayed for some time. Liu technique has been there and Hermann technique has been there, which is a, a different type of loop. You might have known Hermann loop where it is uh, uh, three areas. It has the edge so that uh, sharp cutting can happen. They also do like you. Uh, the small cuttings and then push small cuttings and push 
do you think they can ever compete as the time goes on much of the may much of the surgeries are going towards the laser a pinpoint laser and little bit of mechanical slowly the momentum for the loops have come down in last three years well, you have to know that Thomas Herman is uh, one of my best friends in urology, but he okay. cannot live a simple life. He always has to have it difficult. And uh, so he produced this uh, Herman uh, uh, thing. And I think it made something nice, complicated. We have this nice, small laser fiber. We can really pinpoint on a millimeter. And with this bipolar, um, um, whatever and it is much rougher it is it is not as elegant as that what we what we could do before and uh, that's one point of my criticism and the other is with the laser fiber um, you have only a very small distance of about five millimeters from the tip of your instrument to the right. laser fiber yeah, yeah. with this bipolar thing it is more than that so you have uh, more of your instrument out of your actual actual mechanical abilities and uh, i think that makes life not easier not easier yeah in extension of this laser enucleation of prostate we are in some cases enjoying in block resection particularly two to five centimeter sub tumor on the lateral side without any zero risk of uh, obturator gel uh, you might have done a lot uh, with this experience and expertise so you're talking about bladder tumors now yes sir yeah 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 it, it is very nice and very elegant to do. Yeah. But the problem is to get the specimen out. If you have a big bladder tumor, you, you've done it nicely on block. You say there's a, a muscularis down there. So I've, it's exactly how you would like to have it. And then you have the specimen swimming in your bladder and, and then you question how to get it out. That's the problem. So we need a, a, a basket, a, a, um, capture basket uh, for this specimen. You can develop that. Uh, do you ever experience deep perforation leading to fluid to be drained at the end of the surgery? I became very relaxed about that. When I did my residency many years back, uh, as soon as we perforated, we opened this patient up, we sutured the bladder. But you see, um, it is incredible what we can do to human beings and they still survive. So. Uh, we can do big holes into the bladder and um, and they, it's still okay. So as long as it's extraperitoneal, I'm relaxed anyway. If it's intraperitoneal uh, and I don't see bowel, I'm still sort of relaxed. If I see bowel, I become nervous. So, But we don't do anything. We just leave the catheter uh, in there for longer time, let's say three to five days and in a very big perforation we then do um, a cystogram before we remove the catheter. But uh, again, it's incredible what we can do to humans. Uh, if you have uh, 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 by chance in my first 10, 15 cases when I'm converting, you know, I'm not able to lift the gland from the enucleation to TURP, I feel difficult to do TURP because large volume will be there. You have to really go on to the capsule lot amount of tissue between the luminal surface and the capsule will be there especially after half of the gland is lifted up uh, if at all because turp is anyway the rescue for a junior a comment on that well um we always go to the capsule and then what you're just talking about is sort of a mushroom technique you solve it from the capsule and and then and you devascularize uh, the adenoma and then I asked our um, medical student to resect it. They love it because there are no bleeders anymore, because the, the blood supply has been covered by me. You have this dead adenoma, but it cannot run away because it's still attached. So I say, OK, cut it down. I sit in the back and uh, when he's having problems, uh, I take it over. But this is how to, uh, to teach him TORs if you still want to teach them TORs, because my residents, they don't learn TORP anymore. And, uh, because uh, this is completely out. You don't need TORP. In your vast experience of uh, surgery in endourology, 
this tulium fiber laser slowly taking the hearts of many surgeons do you think that it will hit very badly mini perp less than 1.5 cm stone do you think that in near future rirs can replace except where ureter is not adequately dilated doing with tulium fiber laser is very very fast because of the high frequency and popcorn so where are we heading towards because you are a favorite surgeon uh, for mini perk in india many times we have seen you you do it and you also do rirs so you are a neutral person i am asking a question uh, significant switch over to rirs is happening down the line 10 years i think it is going towards perk because the instruments are so expensive for rirs um you have single use instruments uh, in germany i just got an offer for single use instruments of uh, 550 euro each which is still more expensive than reusable instruments if you uh, take purchase repair sterilization into account um um and it's a natural disaster because uh, we we talk about um sustainability and uh, 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 uh good nature and we use instruments only for one case so even so my heart beats for rirs um i think uh, with this new laser uh, we will have many more um uh, perks and um and this perk instrument you buy it once and you use it for ages and uh, you can you cannot almost destroy it it's uh, even if you activate the laser within uh, the lumen of your uh, mini very difficult to damage yeah and uh, and then you are just uh, dusting those stones i'm not very fond of popcorning because with a popcorn there's still a few bigger pieces uh, going down the ureter and then you uh, it might have to um, catch it there um so i'm really fond of uh, slowly dusting from the surface down uh, until you just have sand um i think this is the way and especially in our country we have to watch our resources uh, in in only a few years time 50% of all Germans uh, of all people living in this country um are living from welfare they are either under 18 or they are retired like myself so we have one working person per one person who is living on the social system so we have to watch where the money is going in our um, in our healthcare system and we cannot afford but this is the political part and uh, you, you have you have also problems in india every country has that you have an incredible amount of people you have the privilege that you have many young people and enthusiastic people so uh, but uh, a billion people you need resources to treat them and uh, money is not growing on on trees yes the last few questions two are questions uh in large glands when you do when patient most of the times on deuterosteride and then comes back with retention or any other reason for to your pr enucleation do you find non deuterosteride used patient versus deuterosteride use when you do mechanical it's slightly difficult in deuterosteride on deuterosteride patient any any observation uh, fluffy grand uh, less vascular but more sticky type of gland in Uh, patients who have used deuterosteride it it's really funny i would like to work with you because we have this discussion very often and uh, i would like to do a trial that we it, it is four experienced surgeons in my team sir that we say after the procedure this looks like a deuterosteride patient or not and after about 1000 patients we would say how often were we correct and how often were we wrong and i think it's a 50-50 chance um uh we we always say that we always say that it it's different in patients who had to test right but uh, uh, it we we never made this trial we yeah. can do it together okay in extension of this question last question carcinoma prostate is very common nowadays post prostate biopsy if you have any carcinoma prostate uh, unknown unknown carcinoma prostate when you are doing uh a nucleation naturally a nucleation is a procedure whatever said and done based on the capsule 
when it is disrupted because of x y z reason even i am asking to you are channeling post uh, metastatic uh, um, the cars the uh, castration resistant metastatic carcinoma three conditions i am asking post biopsy uh, unknown uh, carcinoma prostate incidentally found uh, a post biopsy and post uh, uh, androgen uh, deprivation therapy uh, how how do you how do you feel the nucleation as well as the gland it is definitely less vascular it doesn't bleed that's a different issue uh, you, you, you missed one part you missed the uh, patient after radiation therapy so that is, uh, that is very difficult. That is, that is very no, difficult. After biopsy, it doesn't do anything at all. Okay. Interestingly, according to the literature, we have incidental uh, carcinoma prostate um, in 3.5% um, of our patients. In our series here, we have 6.1%. Why? Because we are much more complete. We have come much more closer to the capsule than any TOR uh, uh, prostate uh, procedure. So uh, to detect uh, prostate cancer, enucleation is, is better. Um, if uh, the patient had any, and, and then besides that, if uh, this patient is not good for um, radical prostatectomy or whatsoever, but he has obstruction, we do a laser enucleation. And it's surprisingly, surprisingly easy to do. Uh, in most cases, uh, we still find more or less the anatomical structures. Um, and if uh, this prostate cancer is really uh, running through the capsule. We just incise, we create ourselves uh, anatomy. Um, so we, we see prostate cancer patients for uh, enucleation on a very regular basis. And you are absolutely right. If they are under an uh, ADT uh, or after radiation, uh, there's less bleeding. But the patient after radiation has a higher chance to become incontinent after the procedure. At the end, do you like vaporization, which is very cumbersome procedure? Continue I'm not patient enough for a vaporization. No. Vaporization, you can do a half a gram per minute, and in a in a 60 gram prostate, it would be two hours. Not in my very, very cumbersome and lo doesn't look nice even with the button. Bipolar button vaporization is not such a small gland. That's okay, but uh, but anyway. It's uh, not anatomical and it's, it takes too much time, so I, I wouldn't recommend it at all. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the Pure Urology group is uh, the largest group in the world. 195th program today we are doing. Every alternate day we are doing one surgical technique like this for the PGs as well as the learning people. I will be very happy to take some of your unit heads or colleagues uh, in this. I will write a letter to them and uh, if you recommend, uh, we will be very happy. Uh, we, we will learn a lot from you today. I, I know you personally very well. Many times I have seen you in Nadiad. Uh, for last 18 years I am practicing. A uh, lot of conferences I met you. And it's <coughs> great to realize that I am directly talking to you. I am very happy, sir. Thank you for this. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation. Do you know the number of uh, participants we had today? Can you see? Uh, no, sir. I can save now. Can you tell, sir? Uh, sir, uh, we will do one thing. Just I will switch off the participation. Then you tell, sir. One second. So that this this program is lifelong program. This video link, excellent program. Anytime people can see with the same YouTube link forever. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. By tomorrow, uh, by tomorrow I will send you the, this. It will be minimum fifteen hundred people already. Already one hundred and fifty people have watched. It will go above thousand. Oh my goodness! Yeah, uh, and th that will be there forever on the YouTube link. Uh, uh, and, and your name and the topic name so uh, so that they can view night aram say uh, uh, when, when they have free time they can view it just stop the we are stopping the live transmission and now I will, after that I will note down please because otherwise everybody will come to know about his number <laughs> 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 then Indians Indians may call him many people will be there very, very unfortunately I will not be able to come to the Indian